Good morning and welcome to the Morning Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cam, coming to you as always from the Spotlight Studios here in Morristown, New Jersey. My guest today, oh, oh no, from pro, from, from pro snowboarder to money mogul, my guest today has dedicated his life to being America's number one money mentor with a core belief that success is built not by the resources you have, but by how resourceful you can be. His success and national acclaim have come in large part to what he's learned firsthand from seeking a better way to wealth creation and preservation than he learned growing up. He's built and owned 19 companies. That's a lot. With his businesses featuring in Forbes, ABC, House Hunters, and his very own HGTV pilot in 2018. He's currently the founder of The Money School and Money Mentor for The Money Multiplier. It's a lot of M's. Also, as an innovator and visionary in wealth building and real estate, he empowers entrepreneurs, business owners, and real estate investors with the knowledge of how money works. He's also a nationally recognized speaker, author, and podcast host. He's spoken to and taught over 10,000 Americans to living the financial knowledge that fuels lasting freedom. He is Chris Noggle. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Pumped uh, to be here. And I, you know, I love the, that's a lot of M's. That, mm. Mm, right. Yeah. Delicious. <laughs> that's what I would say. Um, yeah. So there's a, I mean, we have a lot to get to in this episode because I just went through that bio and I was like, at first I messed it up at the beginning, but I always start with my guest today and I tried to change it up a little bit. And as a, I guess a non-pro, I, uh, I stumbled a little bit, but there's, that's there's all right. A, that makes this more real. Yeah. That's right. No, this is as real as it gets. So, um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot to, to unpack here in this, in this episode. Um, but pro snowboard, uh, pro snowboarder, that's, that's how the, the life started, I guess. Right. So that was the, the biggest dream, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, I just wanted to be a pro snowboarder and, uh, I come from Buffalo, New York. So we have no lack of snow, but we kind of have a lack of mountains. Like there's, yeah. there's hills. Right. So, and also, you know, to complicate matters, being a pro snowboarder is not the cheapest thing. You got to get to the resorts, buy tickets, buy the equipment. And I come from a very, very lower middle-class family. If even that, you know, where my mom, uh, raised me, you know, in a 700 square foot, two bedroom house that she still resides in today. And she had a hard time to keep a roof over that. So when I came up with this dream of snowboarding, you know, I needed a board and I needed, you know, to get to the hill, but some of those things weren't able to happen. So I had to get resourceful. That's why in the bio, it says had to get resourceful because we didn't have the resources. That's not just some quote unquote, you know, thing that I say, it's my life. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, on that journey, everybody tells you, you can't do it. And how I did it is to do what everybody else was unwilling to do. I couldn't go to the resort. So I had to do the next best thing. We had a country club by my house, the Lockport country club, and it's a ravine. So I would have mom drop me off. I'd I'd always see kids sledding. I'm like, I could still board there. And she dropped me off after school. And this is after I'd learned how to ride. And I would literally find a sand trap and build jumps out of the sand trap. And I'd practice all the tricks that I watched in the VHS videos I got. And then I'd always run out of time, only getting a couple hits. So I I had to get in shape. So I'd run up and down the backyard to get in shape so that when mom dropped me off again, I could get more runs. And that's how I did it. (laughs) <laughs> and I got a trampoline. I, I taped socks to the edge of a snowboard yeah. and, you know, duct taped it on. And I practiced all summer long on a trampoline. Listen, like when you don't have the resources to get to the hill and to travel all the, the fancy places, cause those tickets weren't cheap. You gotta, you gotta make do. And when a dream is a dream, there's nothing that'll stop you from getting to it except for you saying, Oh, I can't do it. That's how I did it, man. Yeah. It was, uh, a cool, cool experience. And I loved every moment of it. Yeah, I love that. And I lived in Rochester, New York for like two years. And I was coaching base two and a half years, almost three, um, and was coaching baseball there. So I would have to go out to Buffalo quite a bit to like recruit and do all that kind of stuff. And you are right, there is no shortage of snow up in that area. So that's for sure. I, you know, <laughs> I get that. But um, so was the the resourcefulness, was that just something that was like a self-starter type type of thing? Or you just like, we're like, I'm, I'm not living this way, you know, no disrespect, but like, I'm not living this way forever. This is what I need to do. Let's just do it. You know, Mike, I've never talked about this on a podcast. So it's interesting you bring that question up. So no, I wasn't a self-starter. My mother had nothing. So I watched and I grew up with my mom saving and, and how she like, let's just pick on a new lawnmower. We had two acres that she had to mow. So to get a new lawnmower when the other one literally was held together together by duct tape and who knows what else, you know, she would basically take all the extra change from everything during the week and put it in this big glass jar. She still has it. And I watched my mom do this. And then my mom got me this little black slider box and I still have it. And what I would do is I would go out and I would, you know, do the same thing. I would mow lawns for neighbors. I would shovel driveways. I was just like, literally like a little kid, not even a teenager. And I would have my, I'd give my mom the money and she'd put it in my little black box while she put money in this glass jar. So that was kind of like, 
all I knew. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to say I lived in an, a little bubble or an insulated life because I sure. didn't. Right. I, I went to school and did all those things, but like, this is just the world I, the environment in which I grew up. So that's how I got resourceful is like, if we wanted or needed something, this was the path to get it. And, you know, it's just, that's how I grew up. So I can't take credit for like being some whiz kid or some like, you know, special person that was able to figure something out. I just mimicked what mom did. Right. And what I think is also interesting about that story is that like, you know, you, you do achieve that dream, right? You wanted to become a pro snowboarder. You did what you needed to do to make that dream happen. So I think that that just shows like classic Western New York blue collar work ethic. I mean, when people think like Bill's mafia, like they're like blue collar salt of the earth type people and they work hard. And that's, you know, what I'm gathering so far from this interview. But eventually you achieve that dream. So what was that experience like knowing that like the time and effort that you put into it paid off? Oh my God. I mean, it was a dream. I I mean, what else can you say? I mean, literally there was a a long period of time, you know, when I became an amateur pro or amateur rider, which quickly moved into the pro rider. I I was literally living in, I I don't want to call it a false reality, but it was like every day was just the greatest day on earth. I got to travel on somebody else's dime. I got to meet the legends that I had seen. I got to literally be in contests with the guys that eventually won the Olympics, you know, and I, I, I just, it just took it all in and it just, it just became its own thing. And, you know, as a pro snowboarder, a lot of people think, Oh, pro snowboarders must make a ton of money, but compared to other sports, peanuts, sure. Sean white and some of the legends made millions and millions, but the average pro snowboarder probably today, maybe makes 20 to 40,000 bucks back then with all my contracts I had with every sponsor, I probably made 25 base. And then I had photo incentives and video incentives, which would push me 30, 35, but I, I, it didn't matter because like, in that lifestyle, like I lived out of a bag, right? I, I was traveling all the time. Summers I was at Mount hood coaching, you know, or, or riding and filming and everything was covered by someone else. So that money felt like it was a lot. Yeah. So, and plus I was young. I mean, I was, you know, late teens, early twenties. So, and, and in this process, like I also started a company out of my mom's basement at 16 called fat clothing company, P H A T. So it was a clothing line. And I would just sell that at all the events where I would compete and the shop owners would bring my clothing in. So I had that going, which then after seeing all these shop owners having stores, I got this grandiose idea at 17 that I was going to open not fat clothing company. I was going to open fat man board shops. Cause Hey, I had the clothing line and I was the man. So fat man, there you go. And, uh, 17 years old, this is 1993, if I pinpoint it right, I, I went around and I told my mom this. And, you know, everybody else that I told this to said, you're crazy. It'll fail. It'll never work. Like, why would you do this? But my mom was like, yeah, just go for it. Yeah. So I did. I went for it. And I got turned down by everybody. I needed 70 grand. And I didn't think 70 grand was like hard to get. But boy, at 17, it's impossible. <laughs> and uh, after kid. I finally... <laughs> Yeah. After I finally (laughs) learned like what collateral was when the bank said, Hey, we need some collateral and we can give you this SBA back loan. I'm like, well, 1986 Buick Skyhawk, uh, 125 KX dirt bike, pretty sweet FMF pipes. Like you guys want that. And I got this baseball card collection. They're like, no kid, we're we're talking about like a house or, (laughs) you know, a bank account that has this much. And I'm like, Oh, uh, so I went around everybody. I knew dad, Great uncle and that dad said, no, stop with this stuff. Come work at the factory. And I didn't talk to dad almost two years, not because I was being selfish, but because my dad never supported my dreams. And at the end of it, my mom, uh, you know, I call her my unconditional one, the one that always taught me to dream. She saw this happening. She'd never lived her dreams and she didn't want mine to fail. So she put her house, the 700 square foot, two bedroom ranch on the line as collateral for this $70,000 SBA back loan. And, yeah. you know, I'm 17, I'm gung ho, like, yeah, let's do this. In November of 94, we open, but you know, it's, as a young teenager, like, I, I guess I wasn't quite ready for the pressures that puts on me. Yeah. And there were many nights where I'd be at the store in the back room and I'd, I'd just be there crying, man, just not knowing how am I going to get through to the next day? I, I can't lose mom's house. How am I going to make this? And it's so funny. Like the payment, and I'll never forget, it was $1,638 a month. Yeah. That was the monthly payment. Like today in retrospect, you're just like, yeah. how did you have a hard time paying that? But, <laughs> and this is 94. Yeah. That might just as well have been 10,000 a month. Yeah. And, uh, we made it through that. And, you know, those stores, Fat Man are still open today. I sold them in 2010, but that, that dream, continues on with a snowboard family that I sold it to. So it's really 
awesome to know that your legacy that you created so long ago is still helping people go out there and, and, you know, go skate pools and slide around and have fun. And uh, yeah. that was, that was my other dream. And that just filled into that snowboard dream. So like I said, there was, I was just like in this bubble yeah. until the early two thousands when I, I met my first recession, the dot com crash, that's when things actually got real. And that's when I landed in wall street. Cause nobody else would hire me. Even <laughs> little Caesars <laughs> wouldn't hire this punk snowboard kid to deliver pizzas yet. Wall street wants me like, right. What is well, going shake it up on a little here? Bit. Wall Street needs to shake yeah. it up. They get it, you know? <laughs> I'll never forget that first interview. I, I didn't have a suit. So my grandma luckily, you know, knew of a suit place. She took me down there, got me this gray suit, this gray shirt, and this zip-up tie because I didn't know how to tie a tie, and off yeah. I went. And, and that's that's where I ended up for 16 years, man. Yeah. And not that firm, but, uh, you know, I stayed in the Wall Street world for a long time until I learned that, that world is complete nonsense. And uh, I, I ended up selling my practice and retiring from the official financial advisory or RIA world in 2018. Right. So uh, there's so much in there, which I thought was great. So talk to me also about just like the mindset thing, because, you know, you said like everybody was saying no, 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 no. And I feel like a lot of people that start to do type of, I mean, like I started a podcast last year to help my title insurance sales. And you know how many people said, what the F are you doing? Like, how does that make it's any genius. sense? But like all the sense. it's working, you know, just like as just so everyone knows right now it's working. So, but yeah, so like, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, like subtly, of course, because, you know, sometimes there are people that are very connected to me. But, um, you know, I think that one of the things that I, I, I found and I'm sure that you felt this, too, is like all you just needed was like one person, like one person in your corner was like, hey, that's actually like a great idea. You know what I mean? So talk to me about the importance of that, like, you know, balancing the one person that says yes and the X number of people, the, you know, several people that say no, and like how you're able to filter those out and then really hone into the the one person. Such a great question. And, and it, it's such an important question because looking back, you know, everybody told me I couldn't. And that to me just fueled the I can, but you can't really do it if you don't have at least that one person that is your cheerleader, that one person. And, you know, we're writing a book called The Unconditional One, and it's literally about what you just said. It's about the one person in your life. And it doesn't matter who it is. I mean, if any of you have ever seen the movie Rudy Rudiger, like we just had him out speaking, he's such an amazing soul, but he had that one person and it was that janitor, right? That guy that, you know, he yeah, worked yeah, right. for, like he believed in him, but, you know, never really like patted him on the butt and said, yeah, go get him. But he never didn't believe in him. And he never said, you can't do this, but his family did and his brothers did. So, the one person is so important in everybody's life. But the problem with the one person is you have to open your eyes and actually realize that that person is your unconditional one. You can't just go through life just trying to find this person that's going to give you things or like, you know, just open a door and make things happen. That, that one person will do probably none of that. Right. It will be the least likely person in your life that will actually be able to help you, but it will be the most influential person in your life that will help you achieve everything you want because they allow you to believe in yourself. They allow you and tell you over and over, you can do this. You got this. Don't listen to them. There's no one that can stop you. That right there is far more valuable than any money anyone can give you, than any job or introduction somebody can give you. Because without that, it's so difficult to navigate, especially in today's world. This is a crazy time in history that if you don't have at least that one person in your life, it's, it's a difficult world. I mean, the world in today is all about you conforming to other people's ideologies, to right. other people's beliefs, and it's, to conforming to other people's failed reality and failed dreams. Like we are so influenced by people that have never lived the day that we want to live, the yeah. perfect day we want to live, that I, I can't understand why people listen to them. My father never lived the life I wanted. So why would I take advice from my dad and go work for the factory? You know, my teachers that didn't believe in me, like, why? I don't want to be a teacher. So why are you giving me advice against what my dreams are? But then that one person who'd never done anything I, I did, but that one person that just said, you know, you can't was the, the single most important person in my life. And still today, continues to be. Now I will say that the, you know, mom, there has been times when I've been in my darkest places, 2008, 2014, when I'd lost it all twice, you know, when I was at the bottom, she was saying, can't you just be normal? Can't you just be like everybody else and just be, you know, happy and be content. My mom just wanted me to be happy. But for me, the fire never went out. 
and I just wasn't willing to just be content. So, you know, the, the biggest difference between success and failure for every, all your listeners. And really for me is you have to literally draw a line in the sand. You have to decide, are you going to create or are you going to conform? Because there is no in between. There's no gray area there. Right. You're either going to create something and create the life you want, or you're going to conform to what other people want your life to look like. So you got to pick. Yeah, hundred percent. That's that's a fantastic answer. Because like I said, I mean, I've gone through the same type of thing, and I feel like you know that there's a lot of similarities there. So let's go back to the story, right? So you're now on Wall Street. You're working on Wall mm-hmm. Street, right? So. I would imagine just kind of the way that you described it, that you did not necessarily like fit in air quotes. There. Um, <laughs> not at all, man. Right. So like, so how do you like, so you get there and then is it like, are, is this a success story? Is this a, is this like a failure story? Is this kind of just like, what is this? Like, I can't do this. And then you, then the entrepreneurial bug kicks in again and you kind of go down that road. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. And, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of take one from the Steve, you know, Sims playbook. There was a point in Steve Sims where he had to put a suit on and, you know, he literally felt so out of place and out of his own skin that literally he went back to wearing black jeans and black shirts. So that was me. So I entered wall street where you have to wear a gray Navy blue or black suit every day with a tie. I'm a snowboarder. I don't wear suits. I don't wear ties. I wear hoodies. I wear beanies. Like that's just the life. Right. So it was a, it was a mind mess up for me. It, it, it went against everything I believed in. So here's how I did it. And this is weird. You can trick your mind. You can get your mind to believe in anything as long as you kind of point it in the right direction. So there's this, this company called Volcom huge in the skateboard and snowboard industry. Like the, the, the company that I modeled most of my companies after is that one. And they just so happened to make suits. Now the suits were regular suits and they came in black, gray, and Navy blue. Perfect. And they came with a tie and they were cheap. They were like 180 bucks. Cause I had a shop. I could buy them at wholesale. So I ended up ordering these suits, but the suits were no different than the ones you'd buy at Brooks brothers, except for the lines in the back were different the pocket squares like had skateboard snowboard things. And that little change allowed me to feel like a snowboarder yet be in a world that was so foreign to me. Right. And because of that, what happened is I got comfortable with that. And then I started realizing I got in this environment where there's all these guys making all this money. You pull in the, the, the cars in the, the lineup where I'm just like, Holy crap, Porsche, BMW, Mercedes, you know, it was just like every car I've ever wanted. And I'm just like, this is awesome. So I got that little thing, but then I got in there and I realized, wow, these guys get here at like nine, nine 30, you know, the, the good ones are here at nine. Like nobody's here earlier. Right. They're going out for lunch. You know, they're never here for lunch. I'm the only one in the office at lunch and they're gone at four, four 35. Maybe they're gone. So I'm like, all right, that guy in the office at the end, that big office down there, I watched him. I watched what he did. He worked really hard when he was there. He had a staff and I just mimicked it. And all I did is I said, all right, if I want that office and I want to make more money than him, all I need to do is do what he's not doing. So I got there at 7 a.m. I did all my paperwork, got everything done so that when the phone was ready, when people I could call them, nine o'clock, I was on the phone. Right. People went out to lunch. I just didn't have money to go to lunch. So I picked mulberries <laughs> right. from a mulberry tree at the apartment where I rented and I had a little Tupperware and I dialed well people were out to lunch. And I knew that when lunch happened, people weren't working. So they'd answer their phones. And then people would leave at five. You know what I did at five? I got in my car and I went and visited people at their, their tables, their, their kitchen tables. And I did this for years and years. And when you do things for so long, you just develop a pattern. Then you start looking at everybody else and like, no wonder you guys aren't successful. No wonder you guys are bitching that you're not making enough money. Like you guys don't even want to work. You think this is a nine to five. This is a business just like my skateboard shops, which I still had. And when I went to wall street, that was a hard thing too. I had to dis, I had to literally pull myself out of working in my stores and I had to work on my stores. So I had to put people that worked for me in charge and make them managers. And I thought it was going to collapse. I I remember thinking, all right, well, I'm going to do this because I'm making more money in Wall Street than I was in the shops. It's probably going to crash and burn. And the exact opposite happened. I gave those people the ability to be creative. And there's that creation thing. And they took those stores to a whole new level. Things happened in those stores without me doing anything. And all all I did is I was at the top and I just would look in and I would just say, okay, well, let's do an event and let's do this. And those guys would like, just make it happen. Yeah. It was so much fun. But then I was able to focus on the Wall Street thing, which I became one of the top three advisors in that firm in, in a short period of time. From 2003 to 2008, I was one of the top dogs. And in, in a world like that, that usually doesn't happen. But I just did, like snowboarding. Remember the story with the yeah, snowboarding? I did right. what everybody was unwilling to do. I did the same thing here. And it just worked. 
Yeah. It worked really, really well. Do you think, and, and not knowing much about like being a, a like a employee on wall street, was it something where, and I, 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 from my experience, selling title insurance for the company that I work for is extremely entrepreneurial. So I can mm-hmm. do stuff like this and it ties into what I'm doing. And, you know, as long as my numbers are good, everyone leaves me alone. So was that something that you also experienced? Because obviously you had, you know, you had a good work ethic, you had the entrepreneurial thing, the entre- entrepreneurial background, and then you get into this world. Was it like, was it similar? You know, you're obviously working for like a company, I would imagine, like you're not mm-hmm. just like your own guy, but it was it, did you have that entrepreneurial like opportunities to kind of do things and kind of separate yourself from everyone else? Yeah, I think I got really lucky. Like I didn't go to work for a bank or like a, a Merrill Lynch. I went to work for a company that really instilled their their reps. Uh, that's what we were registered reps or advisors to kind of self, you know, self-complete. And actually, like we were able to create our own DBAs, our own companies within their company. So, you know, I eventually got to be part of a with a couple other advisors, ROI Financial Group, where we were our own unit operating, paying our own rents, doing everything, had our own staff, our own employees. So the environment environment that I was in was just by chance, because there's a lot of firms where you are an employee. The first year I was, I was employed W2. The second year you, you actually, they forced you based on production to go into this 1099 world. So yes, it was, it was very much like you're saying it was very conducive for somebody with a free spirit or an entrepreneurial spirit to thrive right. because it was your success or your failure was solely based on you, your work ethic and your ability to do what they teach you to do. And if you failed, like God, I, I can't even count how many people I saw come in and go back out the door and I can pinpoint exactly what happened each time. They made a bunch of money by chance. Maybe they came from a wealthy family and they got all their family to move money over. But then all of a sudden they got to that arrival point. Oh, I made, you know, 150 grand last year. Awesome. Good luck doing it this year, man. It's not right. about how much you made last year. It's about how much you kept or how much you're able to make this year. And that's where they always failed. They, they'd make money quick and then they'd be gone because they'd go below it. Me, I was just consistent, man. I, I came from that humble beginning. So when I made a bunch of money, all I did is I just, I put it away. Yeah. You know, I just kept putting it into, you know, whole life policies. I put it into the markets and I just did that for years and years and years. And I lived very humbly. Now that did change. I'm not going to lie. There was a, a point where I kind of caught the, the ego bug and, you know, I was one of the top guys and yeah, then I got the fancy cars, bought the big old house, like, and started doing all the things that, you know, people that failed do and lived right. at my level or maybe even sometimes above. And that's probably one of the reasons why I crashed and burned. You know, I, I just got out of my, my, cozy little comfort zone, which is like Warren Buffett, just consistent and persistent with what I was doing. And, uh, the second I stepped out of that, cause my ego got so big that I was his big advisor, boom, you know, Mike Tyson, you know, everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face. Right. I got punched in the face. Yeah. So can we talk about the punch in the face? Was it just because sure. like you changed up your mindset or was it just like, you know, things happen in the world? Like what, what happened? Well, th- things happen, but the yeah. mindset was, you know, definitely there. So what happened is, um, you know, I gotten into real estate. Oh, six, I did my first flip. Oh, seven, I did another. And in oh, eight, still had my retail store. So I got an opportunity to buy a dilapidated paint store, two buildings down from my my main shop. I had three stores going at that time. And I was like, I'm going to buy this dilapidated paint store, 370 grand or whatever they sold it for. I'm going to renovate it into a three unit apart or complex where I can have two retail spaces that pay for the entire building. And it was a brilliant idea. And I got in that process, borrowed money from somebody I shouldn't have that definitely was the wrong person to borrow money from. But, and then, you know, exactly what happened. Like I thought my life was going this direction. All of a sudden I'm going this and the great depression hits. Yep. The Great Depression, or Great Great Depression, Great How Recession. <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, no, here's the problem why I say the Great Depression is I think what we're what's happening now right. and what's going to happen in the next two years will be the next Great Depression. So I've studied history to the level of people would think I'm absolutely batshit crazy. But anyway, this was the Great Recession. Yeah. And the Great Recession brought me to my knees. I literally went from making a bunch of money and then the recession hits. My store sales dipped 30%. I still had all the expenses of this new building, which wasn't done. My re- my financial advisory business pretty much flatlined. Nobody was investing money. Nobody, people were just taking money out. So actually my income was going down. Uh, and I literally got one payment away from being bankrupt. Like I couldn't pay this hard money lender. The building wasn't done. I didn't know what I was going to do. I 
maxed out my 401k loans. I maxed out all the loans from my policies that I had. And I just didn't know how I was going to get it. I came home. I just moved in my brand new trophy girlfriend. She just moved into my house. And I remember saying to her, I said, sweetie, Lewis, I, I need your help. I need your help paying the mortgage. I need your help paying the utilities. And by the way, my friend Pete's going to move into that bedroom down the hall. And my friend Jessica is going to move into that bedroom. Right. Like I had a, I thought like I'm an optimist. So I thought I had a 50, 50 shot. Like I thought, all right, there's 50, 50 that she's going to stay or leave. Right. My friends were like, dude, you got a 10% at best chance yeah. that she's going to stick around. <laughs> That's generous. I would put 10% at pretty generous personally. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I did it. And I remember the night it was 11 PM. Cause I was so nervous about asking her, but I had nowhere else to go. Yeah. You know, I didn't know anyone else. She had a big girl job at a bank. So she had a little bit of money. I figured, all right, well, let's put it on the line. And I think she kind of liked me because you know, we're, we're, we're still married. We have a 16 month old and uh, that's, that's, all she wrote there. Right. Yeah. Which that's, is great. That's what happened. Yeah. And then, so uh, when most, most people, not everyone, when they hit the rock bottom and obviously you're, you know, here with me today and you know, you seemed like you kind of pulled it back together. There has to be the bounce back. So let's talk about the bounce back. So she must've said, so she clearly said yes. And then what was the process that took you to kind of get back to, you know, back to neutral Time. and then, yeah. and then moving forward? It was just time. I yeah. mean, I made it through that. I ended up getting that plaza done. I, I got, you know, sometimes we, we also, and I, I'm not going to leave this out. Sometimes I go over this, but sometimes we have to understand that there's a higher power. You know, the universe has a plan for us. And sometimes even though we fall on our face, the plan still continues. And dude, some things happened after that, that I really don't talk about a lot. And I really can't put words to, but just the right people and the right things happened at exactly the right times. And I was able to refinance that building, uh, with the bank, no banks were lending. You guys remember 08, yep. there wasn't a bank out there lending to this brand new, you know, wall street real estate guy or whatever the <laughs> hell he thinks he is. And I got the financing. I paid that hard money lender off and I just, started going back at it. I went back. The ego got left behind because I had no ego anymore because I had no money. Right. Money created the ego. So I just went back to doing what I did, just working my butt off. And in 09, I, I started really looking at the real estate market because I, I, Warren Buffett, I, I started reading a lot of books too. And I read a lot of Warren Buffett's books, You know, The Intelligent Investor and every book Warren or Graham put out, I read them. And they always said, buy low, sell high and don't lose money. So I said, you know, the lowest asset is real estate. I was scared of the stock market, even though I was sell in yeah. the market selling the stock right. market, I was scared of it. So I started buying real estate and I didn't have money. So what I was doing is financing. I'd save up just enough to get 20% down. And, and I was, I bought one then I did another. And from nine to 14, I got up to 36 units. It was highly leveraged, but I got up to 36 units. And like, you know, I, I felt like I was making it. I felt like I, I think I got it. You never see the movie, the perfect storm yep. in my life at that point was exactly the point where they're in the boat they're going up the waves but they see the sunlight right and the storm ends right there guys it's as far as we got to go but then we all know what happened in the story right yeah a rogue wave came took them down and they all died well the same rogue wave hit me in 2014 i'm on a roll with real estate still snowboarding professionally the shops i had sold in 2010 just because i i couldn't keep you know i just couldn't do it and i sold the strip mall too so I brought the 37th deal to the bank and the bank said, no. And I said, well, I got all these other ones. I've been perfect payers. Like I make decent money. Like what's the problem? And the banker, Greg was his name, tells me you don't fit in the, you know, in a nice way. He said, your debt to income ratio doesn't work. In other words, you don't fit in our bank's little square box. Right. And I'm like, well, how, like this property of cash flows, this, this one does this, like, how does this not make sense? I've penciled out, here's my pro forma. And he says, yeah, but you're, you're borrowing in your personal name. So we can't use those numbers or we can only use 70% of those numbers. You don't qualify. But then when they, they did that, I was like, all right, well, I won't buy this one. Some things happened after that and they froze my line of credit. I got behind in one of the mortgage payments. So they then started to attempt to, you know, basically accelerate that mortgage and, and take it back. And it was game over for me, man. Like once that spiral started, like there was nowhere for me to go. So I ended up having to sell all those properties, me and my wife, Larissa, or she was my fiance. Then we bought our dream house, 171 Radcliffe and by today's standards. It wasn't crazy, but it was a dream house then for sure. Yeah. And, uh, we, we loved it. We had nice cars again. You know, she had a BMW, I had an Audi. Uh, so life seemed to be getting better. And now all of a sudden here is Mike Tyson again, punching me in the face. And I, I literally 
hit like at this if you thought 08 was bad <laughs> this was the point where literally I, I went past the bottom and I'm just like holy shit that went fast yeah like I just saw it go by <laughs> right. and I'm like where is the bottom yeah and I I literally got to one of the lowest points in my life uh, a point in my life that I often try to just black out of my memory because it was a point where I started thinking about stupid things like should I drive my car into that tree just dumb thoughts where you start thinking I'm a failure. This is the, you know, the second, almost third time I've lost it all. Like, what am I doing wrong? I can't do anything right. And, you know, every single time, especially this one, when I, I just felt like throwing the towel and I wanted to quit. I just wanted to just, just, you know, my mom would even say, just be an advisor, just focus on that. Forget all this real estate stuff, forget all these big dreams. And there was just something in me, man, that creation, that, that desire to be bigger, than what I was and to help more people, just that fire never went out. And man, I picked myself back out of that tough, tough one. And I started changing the way I did things. And it wasn't, wasn't because I wanted to some weird things happen again. There's that universe. I got a postcard in the mail to go to a three day seminar. And it, it said, come learn how to flip houses. And I'm like, I don't want to learn how to flip houses. I've already done that. And on the back, it said, come to this three day seminar. We'll give you a free iPod shuffle. I'm like, Oh, I got nothing to lose, but man, I, I could you use an iPod, iPod shuffle. shuffle. Yeah, hey. right. They're tiny. So Those off are great. I went. Yeah. And I met two guys at that event, the last two speakers, Mike and Greg, and they, they were money guys. One was a big flipper who had a show on a &E. The other was the money guy. And I listened to them intently. Don't know why, because I didn't really pay attention to anything else. And they were talking about money in a way that I'd never, ever heard money discussed. Totally the opposite of everything I knew in Wall Street. And I started saying, these guys are super successful. Why are they doing the opposite of everything I've been taught to do? And right. I ended up uh, swiping a credit card that day to get around them more, going to masterminds and learning and being around people that I was uncomfortable being around because I just didn't feel I was at their level. But I found out that the most successful people are also the most available. So when I got in their circles, they kind of picked me up and they started showing me the way. And being the money guy and an entrepreneur, what I started doing is just saying, okay, I got all these wealthy people. How do I make the best of this? Well, knowledge. So I started asking them all what they did with money. And it was easy for me to talk. It's all I did for 16 years as an advisor is talk about money. So just kept asking them, but the answers I got dumbfounded me. They were all very wealthy, multi-millions or even maybe a, a billionaire here and there, but they were all so wealthy, but they did the exact same things with money. And those exact same things were the opposite of what I did. So I'm like, wait a second, we're doing this and they're doing that. Who's right and who's wrong? But I think they're right. So <laughs> it seems I, like they I, might be right. Yeah. I questioned everything, which yeah. literally made me a terrible financial advisor because literally everything I was doing, I didn't believe in anymore. Right. And I started learning these things and really getting around the, the campfire with them and learning what they did. So all I talked to my clients about were these things, which made me nothing because it wasn't a product you were selling. It wasn't like I'm selling stocks, annuities or anything else. I was literally just, learning the path of the wealthy. And it, it ended up landing in me retiring from the, the Wall Street world in 18, selling my practice, me and my wife going out and having a, a TV show, a pilot on HGTV for flipping houses. And ever since then, it's literally been my journey to just learn the secrets of the wealthy. And I, I constantly call myself a student, no matter how much I know, I'm called America's number one money mentor. And you know what, if I have some one person tell me about something, man, I'll just pop myself up, I'll pull a pillow, tell me. Yeah. And, and then I'll determine whether that's right or wrong. And that's, that's how I operate. Okay, that I love that story. And like, I was writing notes as you were talking. So one of the it's things that I think that was like, so interesting about that, it's like, I think it's like a Greek myth or something where the guy is in hell and he keeps pushing the rock up the hill and it gets to the top of the hill and then it rolls down, crushes him, it goes back down to the bottom of the hill and he has to push it back up. So like, here you are, like you basically start from having essentially nothing. You kind of build yourself up and you have what you think you need to be successful and all that. Boom, rock goes back to the bottom of the hill. Then you push it back up again, rock goes back to the bottom of the hill. But what I think is so interesting about this particular instance that you're talking about is like when you were talking to me earlier about how you were doing all the things that other people weren't willing to do or weren't doing, and then all of a sudden you meet these two guys that are talking about money in a different way, I feel like that must have resonated with you so much because that was like, that's like your thing, I feel like. It's like doing the opposite. It's like the Costanza. I'm going to do the opposite, and that'll be the right thing to do. And like all of a sudden, now I feel like this is, you know, you're you know pushing the rock back up the hill. I'm sure it's going to keep going, obviously. But, you know, like talk to me about the importance of like maybe the disruptive or, you know, different kind of method that they kind of used and how you've now built that into your approach. 
Yeah. And it, it was very difficult because I mean, when you're taught one thing your whole life or your entire career, then all of a sudden something disrupts your train of thought and your belief system. Now, all of a sudden you really have to go on a journey. Most people won't ever do this because they just won't accept the fact that there are other things out there. They think what they know, their skill set, what they've learned from their family and their peers is all there is. Yeah. And that is literally the biggest reason why you know, if you take a hundred people, only five of them will be financially successful. The other 95% will not is they just don't want to change their mindset. Well, it was hard for me to change it, but I just really, luckily, <laughs> fortunately, I was at the lowest point. I had no other choice, right? Literally like change your mindset and, and just be open to this and like realize that we're still going to like live in this world, but we're going to really try to learn what they're doing. And it was, uh, it probably was exactly that doing the opposite of everybody doing what everybody else was unwilling to do. I had gotten so comfortable with wall street and stocks, mutual funds, all the things, you know, back then things were a little different than they are now, but that's pretty much, I thought I was at the top of that pinnacle, but literally that top of that pinnacle, when I got there, I saw the ugly side of that world. I saw where that world was absolutely not helping people. Like I thought it was, right. it was actually more helping me, the brokerage, the firms I was at. And it was really hurting my clients, but I had had the rosy colored glasses on for so long. Oh, I usually have those little red glasses on for that, but <laughs> it, I had the glasses on so long. And now, you know, at this point I take the glasses off because I saw a different side and I, I, I just didn't like what I saw back there. Right. It was, it was at my production, literally like I went from making hundreds of thousands of dollars as an advisor to immediately when this happened and I switched my mindset to this new way of thinking about money, my production went down to like 80 grand. And the, the brokerages that I was at were like, Hey, I thought you were the, the whiz kid, the rock star. I'd switched firms at this right. point. And, uh, you know, I'm like, well, I, I was, <laughs> but now I'm doing this. Yeah, and they're right. like, well, we don't really do that. So good luck, you yeah. know? And, but, uh, there was no way for me to monetize this side. It was just a, a discovery period for me. It was, and it was many, many years of just following wealthy around. And every time to get around these people, it wasn't just like, Oh, I'm just going to go to the park. No, you actually typically had to pay to go to an event to be in their presence. But when you were in their presence, you were one of them. They didn't know that I only made, you know, at that point, 80 grand. I probably actually was pretty close to poverty at the one point, you know, but they didn't know that. I yeah. was just in the circle. I, I knew this guy and this guy liked me and said, hey, these are my friends. And then they just, it, they just took me in, man. And you tell them your story and they're like, oh my gosh, yeah. Like, this is what we're doing. Yeah, Joe's doing this too. Hey, you know, Billy over here, he's doing the same thing. Like, we, we all do the same thing. We never talk about it. And I'm like, well, why wasn't I taught this as an advisor? So me being that kind of, you know, rebellious kid, if you will, comes out. And I and I had already left this one firm, but I was still friends with the managing partner. And I took John, that's his name, John. I took him out to dinner or to lunch one day at the brew pub. And I said, John, I, I just got to ask you one thing. I spent 14 years with the company. I was one of your top guys. And I know we had some falling out. So, you know, when I left, but why is it that you never taught me about this? You know, I was talking about the infinite banking concept and privatized banking. I said, why haven't you taught me about this? And he, he literally, he's like, well, I know exactly what it is. It's just like what the banks do with Bully and what corporations do with Coley. So he knew it kind of. Yeah. And, he, and he says to me, he says the most brilliant thing ever. And it just put it all into perspective. He said, Chris, I want to, I want you to think of it this way. You, you spent 14 years here. Do you remember your first year? I said, Oh, I remember it. Like it was yesterday. I made 74 grand and it's the most money I'd ever made. He said, yeah, but how many people from when you came into that new org to when you actually evolved out of that, how many of those same advisors were still there? I said, two out of like 20 some. He said, okay, fast forward to the next year. So year number two, how many of them were still there? I said, oh, wow, none. And he said, okay, so fast forward to the next year. You saw the next group come in. How many of them are still there? I said, one. And he said, so if my job is to attract and get new advisors to go out and do and sell our products and everything else. And then all of a sudden I go to these new agents, even the experienced agents, and I show them this amazing thing that you're talking about, which it truly is. I show them this and I show them how they can help their clients do this. But then I got to drop the hard news on them. And I got to tell them in order to do this life-changing thing for your clients, you have to take a 60 to 90% cut in your income. Right. Go get them, guys. He said, then, Chris, when I tell them that, how many agents and reps do I have left? I said, none. And he said, exactly. 
He said, the companies know exactly what this is. That's why they do it for the banks. That's why they do it for the corporations, but they don't teach their advisors this because it has to, it, the way that it pays, it results in something that no advisor would ever talk about because it would make no money and it would be a waste of time. He said, you stumbled upon something that only the wealthy use. He said, but the hardest thing about what you've stumbled upon is how do you make money? And I said, John, I got it. I got it. I said, it's so simple. It's the same way Walmart did what they did. They had this idea that if they just bring a product into their store, they price it way under what all their competitors have, even though they make a penny. If they do that, they will have millions, if not billions of people buying products because it's the cheapest place they can get them. I said, John, this is the Walmart story for money. I said, if I teach enough people, thousands of people how to do this, but it has to start with giving. You have to just give, 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 teach, 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 because they, they got to change their mindset like I had to. You get them around the campfire. You teach them how to change their life. You tell them how to do it themselves, how to take their money back, how to take back control. I said, if I do that for thousands of people, John, even a little bit of that, that commission that I get, even that little bit of money will be so grand that I will make more money than I've ever made. And, and the best part is, John, I will always make more because more and more people will come because I'm not self-serving. I'm doing what Zig Ziglar said. If you help enough people get what they want, you get what you want. I did that. And dude, to, to say that it's worked is a drastic understatement because it has worked far better than I could have ever done. And I remember at that first mastermind, and let's get back to those two guys, that first mastermind, I almost didn't go. It was $5,000 to go to California to spend time at this Greg guy's house. I had to swipe my credit card, which I didn't have five grand, man. Right. My, my fiance was like, ah, I don't know, but you got to go. You got to yeah. be around Greg. So I did it. And I stayed in the shittiest hotel. I walked to the event because I didn't want to pay for a taxi back. Uh, maybe they had Ubers, but I paid for it. You know, I just walked and I was so uncomfortable, but like that commitment right there changed it all. Because Greg, literally, when I came up to him, I said, Greg, I need, I, I was in a downtime. I said, I need your best advice. He leans in and puts his hand on my shoulder. I just spoke, just interesting parallel. The same Greg guy I'm talking about, I just spoke as his keynote speaker at his flagship event, which is voted by Entrepreneur Magazine as the number one entrepreneur event in the world. And I was his keynote speaker. That was 14. This is 21. Right. You get it. Yeah. So he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I'm going to give you the best advice I can. And he said, then he says it. He says, give your best stuff away for free. And I, I looked at him and I'm like, you son of a bitch. This is what I'm thinking. I'm like, <laughs> right. that's the best advice you have for me, dude. Yeah. I just lost it all. And you want me to give it all away for free? What's, and he says, I know what you're thinking. He says, if you give it all away for free, why is anyone going to need you? They're not. He said, the exact opposite will happen. You give it all for free or away for free. Some people will never need you again and they'll be content. But the majority of the people will be so thankful and grateful that you did give them everything that they wanted. And you never asked for anything in return that they will be your most loyal followers. Anything you come out with, they will basically partake in, and that's how you do it. Dude, right there. Yeah. 14, lowest point in my life. That's what I did. Right. It was well, hard. It wasn't yeah. easy. No, it, it was so hard. Yeah, it sounds like it would be hard. <laughs> um, so this is actually not the first time. We've done it one other time on this show where we've talked about infinite banking, but I do want to talk a little bit about it because I would be remiss if we did not, we had you on the show and we never got to it. So let's sure. talk a little bit, maybe like broad strokes, just, you don't have to get into like super detail, but you know, kind of like, let's talk about, you know, what you educate people on and what this, what this type of stuff is all about. Yeah. So the infinite banking concept is not a product. It's a concept. It's a process. It's, it's literally mimicking what the banks do day in and day out with the money that you deposit there. It's literally just taking back the banking functions in your life. So that sounds like hocus pocus stuff. So let's get down to it really fast. And this is for some of you, you're going to have to rewatch this or watch my videos or read my book because there's a little bit to unpack here. I want you to think about what you do. You've been taught your whole life a certain way to handle money. I'm, I'm holding, I don't know, a stack of $1,000 or whatever this is. But you, you go out and you trade hours for dollars. That's what we're taught to do. You work for someone, you get paid, you take that money that you've got paid. What do you do with it? Put, put it in, it the in bank. somebody, well, yeah. not just the bank, oh. somebody else's bank. Okay, you right. put it in a traditional bank that is not owned by you. And what does the bank do? Well, the bank doesn't just put that money in the vault. If you guys don't know, there's no money in the vault anymore. So if you're a bank robber, you're out of business. So the bank then moves that money and they take that money and they lend that money out. And in this process of them moving your money and everybody else's, they make 400 to 1300% more than you do. 
Oh, that's not true. No, they don't. Okay, go to bauerfinancial.com, look up any bank, any time frame. I'm right, you're not. So <laughs> that is what we've been taught to do. And then some of us have taken the next step and be like, yeah, but Chris, I put my money in that 401k. Okay. Great. You do the exact opposite of what you should do with your money. You take your most valuable dollars, this hundred dollars that you work for, which will never be worth more than it is today because of inflation, the hidden tax, and you give up control of it to some firm or some plant. And then that money sits there and you've been baited and switched because they're like, yeah, but you get a tax deduction. Great. Our tax is going up or down. Great. Exactly. Up. Right. So you're going to put the money in, get a tax deduction on the seed, or yeah, you're going to get a tax deduction on the seed at the lowest tax rate you'll probably ever be at. And then time will go by five, 10, 15, 20 years until 59 and a half. And then what are you going to do? You're going to start taking that money back. But what has happened to that money? Number one, you're going to be paid back with weaker dollars because you got whatever amount of time they've become weaker through inflation. Number two, you're going to take that money back and all the, all the gains at a higher tax rate. And number three, and most importantly, you literally gave up five, 10, or 15 years of opportunity because your money was sitting in a false reality called retirement when that money could have literally been put to work for you day in and day out like the bank does. So that's the biggest mistake you are all making. I could go much deeper. But so what did the wealthy teach me? All these people, what did I learn? And is, is this infinite banking concept new? No, it's been around for hundreds of years. The right. Rockefellers, the Rothschilds created it with, and then the JPs, the Morgans, the Walt Disney's, the Ray Crocs, the Doris Christophers, the Walt Warren Buffetts, right up to the sitting president, uh, Biden, and also McCain before he passed. They all use this. So what is it that they know we don't? Well, they know that the banks don't put their money the places we do. Go into your local bank when you hear about this and ask them to put your money where the bank puts their money. The funniest thing is they can't Yeah, and they won't. They, won't they, they literally can't put your money where the bank puts their money, which is ironic, but actually makes all the sense in the world. It's not profitable. So the wealthy people I met, if we learn that we don't want to be out of control of our money and that putting our money in somebody else's bank is not a good idea, well, what other alternative do you have? Well, let's look back to the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds. When they figured this out, and they were bankers, and they didn't trust banks. They had to find a place to store their capital. So what did they do? Well, they said, you know what? Banks aren't safe, but you know what is? Giant mutually owned insurance companies. They've been around forever. They're the most conservative, boring financial companies in the industry, but yet they make all the money and they have all the money. Banks don't have the money. The banks give, that's fake money. It's fiat. They keep 10%. And you know where they keep that 10%? The same exact place I'm about to tell you where the wealthy put their money. Okay. So the Rockefeller said, well, we want to put our money into the, the giant insurance company. So they walk in with their big suitcase of money and they say, Mr. Insurance company, I want to deposit my money. And the insurance company says, we are not a deposit institution. There's the door. Get out. So they said, all right, well that failed. So how do we get our money into that coffer or that general account of that insurance company to make those returns? It was through a product that's been around for hundreds of years called whole life insurance. I know. Soon as I say it, yeah, but Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman said, that's a terrible place to put your money. Yeah. Let's be clear before you hit the stop button that I am not talking about the whole life insurance that your broke ass brother-in-law sold you. <laughs> I'm not talking about the whole life insurance that I used to sell. Right. I am talking about a completely different type of whole life that is specially designed and engineered to work as a banking system, not so much as life insurance. So now that we've got that out of the way that this isn't your grandma's whole life, this is something totally designed different that involves creating a machine to deposit your money. So now I go out and I work for money. And let's just say this is a thousand bucks. You saved a thousand bucks over the, the work week. And you take that thousand bucks and you change where the money goes first. All we did is change one thing. The money doesn't go into their bank. It goes into your bank. What is your bank? A specially designed and engineered whole life policy, which I'm going to call the privatized bank from here on out. So I put the money there. What's the difference? Well, how much does your bank pay you today? 1%? Oh, less than 1%. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So basically nothing. Right. How much does the insurance company pay you on this private bank? Well, I will tell you the guaranteed insurance or guaranteed interest rate that's paid on the contracts up till November 1st is 4%. After four, after November 1st, new rules kick in and it drops the 3.75 down to some companies will be two. So let's just use four because that's what it is today. Plus, these giant mutually owned insurance companies, mutual means not stockholders. So every year they pay dividends just like a stock company would, but they pay dividends to who? Well, the owners of the company. Who are right. the owners of the company? The policyholders. So you get a dividend every year. And every company we work with has paid dividends over 100 years. So let's just put math to it. How much is my money earning, Chris? Get away from all this crap. 
6%, five to 6%, depending on the company. That's how much money I'm making, which is how much more than what you're getting in your bank account. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to rub that in, but that's not, that's not the important part that we're making more. Okay. What's important is what happens next. So I put that thousand bucks there, but let's just say over on this side, I have a visa credit card that I owe a thousand dollars to. And every month they, and they charge me 24.99% interest. And every single month I pay visa $25 a month, which is the bare minimum interest payment. Okay. I just rounded up a little. So thousand dollars you owe visa and you're paying 24.99% and you're paying them the minimum interest of $25. So now what I'm going to do is 30 days after I deposited my money into that privatized bank, I'm going to take that money out. So I'm going to take out that $1,000. And again, there's more to this. Watch the video to learn. I have $1,000 in my hands. So how much money is left in my private bank with the insurance company? I had 1000 and I took 1000 How much is left? Zero. Most people would be like, exactly. Yeah. Well, if it was my bank, it'd be zero. Sure. Wrong. $1,000 is still in my account. This isn't some hocus pocus magic trick, folks. So whose $1,000 are you holding? Did you steal that from the insurance company, Chris? <laughs> no. The insurance company, by a click of a button online, gave me this $1,000. They didn't ask a single question. They just said, how much do you want? Great. I, you have this much available. Click the button. Here's $1,000. So I'm holding $1,000 that the insurance company just gave me. And you might think, oh my God, that sounds too good to be true. Well, there's a little more. Who's This $1,000 was the insurance company's money, but why did they just give it to me? Because the insurance company made a second promise outside of that guarantee. They promised that someday when I graduate, die. Okay. They're going to pay a death benefit to my family. So they just say, all right, well, we got to pay this money out someday. So if you need it today, we'll give you a thousand dollars today as a loan. So they give me $1,000 as a loan. And my thousand sits in that account compounding uninterrupted at a rate of 4% guarantee plus the dividend as of 2021. And then only until November, I just want to be clear and compliant. So now uh, but then, then I just said a swear word. They all heard it, but they're like, oh, he's just trying to bait us and say, he said loan, that's bad. The insurance company gave me a loan. Oh yeah, of course. You got to pay the money back to the insurance company. No, nope. right. the insurance company doesn't care if you ever pay the money back. They gave you part of your death benefit early. They call it a loan because that loan, they're going to charge interest on it. How much interest? Right now it's 5%. So let's do the quick math. You're making six. They're charging you five. You're making 1% spread on money that you have all of it back in your hand. Tell me a bank on earth. Tell me a Wall Street firm on earth. Tell me a crypto company on earth that would do that. They would give you all the money and still let you earn more than what they're charging you. The answer is none. 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 So now I've got this $1,000, but now let's get to the infinite banking concept. That's why the wealthy use this machine. It is called uninterrupted compound interest. All the growth is tax-free and it's self-completing and there's a bunch of other benefits. So now I got a thousand bucks. So what am I going to do with this money? This is where you really make wealth. I'm going to take this and I'm going to pay off Visa. I'm going to take the $25 at 24.99% that I used to give to Visa. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name on the check. Instead of writing Visa every month, I'm going to write Chris Noggle. I'm going to take that $25 I used to give to Visa and I'm going to set up a bill pay and I'm going to put that money back into my bank. Because I don't want to put the money back into somebody else's bank. So I just put it in my bank. So now what I just did is I made money, the spread from the five to the six, okay? We'll call that 1% year one. Plus now I just made 24.99%. Oh, you didn't make 24.99. The hell I didn't. I just took back 24.99% interest that I gave away every month to Visa. I paid Visa off using money that was kind of, I don't want to call it made out of thin air because you had to deposit it, right. but I paid Visa off and now I've got $25. So now I've got interest and in co compounding. Now I've got additional money going into my account. So if I just keep doing that, and if I bought a car with that, it would, might take a few years to save up enough to buy a car. Buy the car. I, I, you know, I did this for my wife and also my vehicle. I buy the car, taking a loan, the same way I just explained. And, it, and I just asked, yeah, I did this at the Porsche dealership. I said, how much would this car cost if we finance it? And you know, you go back and forth negotiating. Finally, it comes up thousand one hundred eight. Said, yeah, all right, let's do it. Pushes the paperwork over for Wells Fargo to sign for the financing. I said, no, no, no I push it back. I said, I don't need this. And he says, well. What do you mean? I said, well, I'm paying cash for the car. And he said, well, why did we go through all this financing? I said, dude, I, I needed to know how much to pay my bank back. Yeah. So $1,108 amounted to principal and interest payments. And that was at a rate of 4.5. So I take that $1,008 that I would have given to Wells Fargo and all of you are giving to somebody else's bank. And I put that money back in my bank. And the coolest part about doing it with a car or anything that you're going to buy a copy machine is 
you would normally just pay that anyway and you wouldn't even think about it. Right. But now every one of those payments goes back into your bank, which never stopped earning interest. And the next day, when you put it back in your bank, you have access to use it again. So then you just go buy something else. Like imagine how your life would change if you had a machine that you could just put money in, take money out of, make a spread. And, and the best part is, is like some of you are like, ah, 1% is nothing. The next year it's more. 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 It never can do anything but grow because that's what compound interest does. Don't believe me? Look up Albert Einstein. He was pretty good at math, just so you know. He called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. The, the strongest thing in the financial universe, I think, or something like that. He said, those that understand it, earn it. Those that don't pay it. I just understand it. You don't. That's the only difference here. Right. And I understand the machine to earn it. So that it, the, you can see there's two things. Number one, there was a machine. And that machine was a very different whole life design than what you know of, especially design and engineer. That was the machine. And all we're going to do is run money through it. The infinite banking concept was the process of how I paid off the visa, how I bought the car. It was the circle. Just draw a circle. The money starts on the left side, goes over to the right to buy the things that you would normally finance or use credit cards for. And then you just complete the bottom part of the circle by recapturing and recycling the money that you would normally pay to somebody else's bank. It's so simple. Yeah. But nobody does this. Why? Because it's not financially conducive for any company to teach you how to do this. Because in order to build that, and some people are like, oh, no, 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 you're making a big old commission on that whole life. No, 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 you're wrong. A whole life pays a big commission to your broke ass brother in law who's still broke. These policies, the way they're designed, pay us 60 to 90% less than your brother in law got paid. So that's why your advisor doesn't tell you about this. I already told you why John you know, told me that he doesn't do it. That's the secret. One has to give for somebody else to get. The infinite banking concept isn't financially lucrative unless you scale, unless you help a lot of people solve their money problems. Sorry, man, I went long, but no, that's that was it. that was fantastic. It's like you've talked about this before. You know, it's no, like that's that my is, first I, time. Oh wow, yeah. So I feel like the more you do it, it's going to get even better. Um, so uh, do you have a couple more minutes? Can we? I, I mm -hmm. get one more question. Maybe, yeah, let's. A couple do it. more questions. So, um, the what is the risk? Right. So like, I, I think that people that are listening to this, they're like, because people are so oh, there's gotta be a to, catch. There's gotta be a catch. Yeah. There's gotta be a gotta risk. Be a there's catch, gotta be something right? where like this all goes to shit if you don't do it, you know, the right way or at Love some it. point something's going to happen. So like, what is the risk? Yeah. So, you know, and I did a great video on my YouTube. If any of you want to watch so, hundreds of videos on how this system works, just go to my YouTube at the Chris Noggle. So here's the risks. Number one, it is a life insurance contract. Even though we put the lowest death benefit on we can, you still have to qualify. So if you got medical issues, if you just don't qualify, maybe you're a little you know, short for your height, or is that how you say it? A little short for your weight. No, that's how they do it. Uh, whatever it is, you know, maybe you don't qualify. That's a risk. Maybe you can't even get this. You don't live in the United States or Canada. Uh, this isn't available anywhere else as far as I know, you know, uh, other than North America. That's a risk. Uh, the uh, dividend. You know, I know that they pay dividends, you know, for 160 years for 140 and 120, but hey, maybe next year they don't. Right. I mean, who knows? Yeah. They paid them through the Great Depression, but why, why, you know, that's maybe a risk. So then all of a sudden now you're only making a guaranteed 4% and, you know, but there's so much to this. And the other thing that I didn't say, some people are hung up on the six and the five. Well, what if it was six and three? Would that change your idea? Okay, easy. Instead of using the insurance company's money, do what I do, use a bank's money. Banks, I told you are the number one purchasers. Banks will give you a line of credit against your cash value. You could use 100% of your cash value. They'll give you free checks, free checks for the first time at a bank. And they will give you approval in one day with a one-page application. Banks understand this is a zero risk game for them. So if you want to borrow at three, just use the bank's money instead of the insurance companies. Now your spread just got that much better. Right. So what other risks do you have? I mean, maybe the dividend doesn't get paid, which never has happened in history with these companies. Maybe you don't qualify. The biggest risk to this whole thing is you don't listen. You don't follow the process. You just put your money in the, in the specially designed whole life and you do nothing else. And you're like, oh, this sucks. It's a process, folks. You have to learn this. You have to actually go out there and figure out how to move the money. The good thing with us is we teach you and we do it all for you. But other people, if you just go to your brother-in-law and say, hey, I want you to give up 90% of your commission, set up one of these specially designed whole life so that I can bank it, and then he builds it and you don't know how to use it. It's not hard to use, but still it's different than what you're doing. So that's a risk. You know, you just fail to learn. Right. I don't know. There's really not a whole lot of other risks. This is a guaranteed contract that is guaranteed by a ginormous mutually owned insurance company that has been around for hundreds of years. So I, I have a hard time sometimes when people say, what are the risks? Yeah. The risk, the biggest risk is you. 
Right. You're your not, biggest enemy. Not doing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Which yeah. is still better than a sharp stick in the eye because you're still better than putting money in a bank account, <laughs> even if you don't do anything. So yeah. Yeah. is that really a risk? Right. Yeah, totally. So, all right. So I'm sure that we could, you know, we've been talking for an hour already. So awesome. I'm sure that we can get more into like, you know, the nuts and bolts of this. And you mentioned your YouTube channel. Um, what are some other places that people can go to maybe learn more about this from you? Sure. Uh, you can go to my website, chrisnoggle.com. It's N-A-U-G-L-E. And when you're there, why not get two free things? Um, I just did this little booklet. It's called Drifting Away from Traditional Car Buying. If any of you are watching this, here's the book. It's free. Just go on my website and literally just click that you want the booklet free. We'll email you the, the ebook. Or maybe you love holding a book in your hand, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery. This is a book that Brent Kessler and I, who met Brent Kessler, is my mentor in this, uh, that we wrote all about that concept. So you can get this book for free. You just have to pay for shipping and handling because I'm not paying USPS to ship it to your house. So you can get those both for free. And also on my website are tons of videos on how to use this to get all the money back for all the cars you're ever going to buy driving home, how to use it to pay off debt, how to use it to buy cars copy machines for your business, how to lend money to your company, and actually how to get paid to drive company cars by using this. It just goes on and on. There's so many videos, and they're all free, and we don't charge for any of them. Like The biggest thing you're going to have an expense is paying the shipping to get the book to your house. Right. So definitely go to chrisnoggle.com and go to my, my YouTube channel, at the Chris Noggle, and subscribe because I put at least three videos up every single week on all sorts of money topics. And the best part about YouTube, it's free, man. Right. It's yeah. Free. Love YouTube. So I, I think one of the things, but this is going to be my last question, I promise. So um, mm-hmm. the mindset side of this, so you said the the one thing that's holding thing people back from, from this or the biggest risk is you. Right. And I think that like, this is something that I, like I said, this is not the first time that we've talked about it on this show. So this is not like <gasps> infinite banking. Mm-hmm. Like we have talked about it one other time on this show. And I think that people kind of like started to get it. And then now they're hearing it from you. So it's not like a one-off thing. And, but I think that sometimes maybe when you're coaching people, when you're mentoring people, when you're talking to people, like how, like what are ways that people can get themselves out of like the, you know, like the, the, the path that everybody's that uh, has gone down already and like sticking in that thing, because I feel like that's like the biggest, you know, like the mental block to take the blinders off, yeah. kind of expand and, you know, think outside the box a little bit. Obviously you've been doing that basically like your whole life, but mm-hmm. not everybody has. So how, how do you kind of like break down those barriers? Yeah, it's really easy. So, you know, first off, I always tell people, I can't fix your broken mindset. I can teach you everything you ever want to know about what the wealthy do with money, but I can't fix a broken mindset. So when I tell people this or they see this, the very first thing most people's minds want to do is say, that sounds too good to be true. There's no way it works that way. Or that's a scam or something along those lines. Well, every time you say that to anything in your life, what is the next thing you should do to fix your mindset? Research it. Like, I'm just a guy on a podcast here, right? It has a fancy name that somebody gave me, but like, hey, why don't you go in and like, look at, hey, did the Rockefellers really do this? Oh, wow, they did. Oh my God, do banks really own that much whole life? Holy crap, they do. Look at Wells Fargo and look, just Google, go on and Google. I just did it today. Google, how much whole life insurance do banks own? That'll blow your mind. Just look at it. It's right there. Yeah. First thing that'll pop up. And then if you really want to dive into Coley or Bully, the way banks and corporations use it, hundreds of pages come up. So like, don't believe me. Like, I, I, this is how my, I've changed my life and thousands of others. And also one thing, you know, if somebody's doing something that is not right, doesn't work the way it's supposed to is a scam. There's things called Reddit. Yeah. Go out there and try to find any negative reviews on Chris Noggle, the money school or the money multiplier. I check often. I haven't known a bit, but I bet you won't find any. There is one that will come up on Reddit with this guy with the money multiplier. He's not even talking about our company. He's talking about what is the money multiplier, which if you look at the Fed and you can figure that out, but that'd be the only thing. So how is it that we've helped over 3,500 people and we add 200 and 200 to 215 a month. And there's not one negative comment. Oh, it's because you just started doing this. Oh, no, no, no. We've been doing this since like 2008. Like, is it because we're, we're telling you something that doesn't work? Or is, is it really that maybe it actually works exactly how we show? Yeah. So that's for you to decide. I can't fix your broken mindset. You can research. There's the, there's this beautiful thing that came out. It's like kind of new. Some of you might not use it. It's called Google. It's all right there. Right. Just Google the answer and you will get it. But you will also see a bunch of people saying infinite banking is a scam. And, you know, you have to decide what's true and what's not. Well, I always say this is somebody's opinion. 
and this is somebody that's actually using it. So on my YouTube channel are a whole bunch of case studies of actual people using this. Don't take my word for it. Look at the results. Look at them talk about it. We didn't pay them. We didn't do anything. Actually, they were thrilled to come on and tell their story so other people could then change their lives. Right. That's the best answer I can give you, man. Yeah. Can't fix a broken mindset, but they could do the research and fix it themselves. Right. I love it. I love it. And I'm sure we could talk for literally like hours uh, just because... I like you. You, you. We could, we could definitely <laughs> vibe. Um, so, but we are gonna. I, I don't want to keep you longer. We have, I've already have. So, um, I'm not gonna keep you too much longer than I than I said I would. So, um, let's move the show into our closing segment, which we call Under the Spotlight. So, nice. the Spotlighters have been listening to Mike Cam and Chris Noggle talk for over an hour now about your background, your career, your life, infinite banking, all these different things. Um, what would be one thing that you would want the Spotlighters to walk away from this episode with? So you are under the spotlight. Yeah, so I knew this question was coming. And I gave it a lot of thought. And I think the best thing I can give everybody is a quote. And, and it's a quote by none other than Will Rogers. You got to love the guy. And he says this. He says, the biggest problem in America is not what people don't know. The biggest problem in America is what people think they know that just ain't so. Be very careful who you surround yourself with. Be very careful with the network of people that you put yourself around or put uh, around you because those people will try to get you to conform to their false reality, their ideologies, their failed dreams. And if you're a dreamer and you really want to make a difference, you got to upgrade that and you got to stop thinking, you know, what you don't know. I know that statement is the most true in the world because I lived that. I thought I knew what I didn't know. And the problem is not what you don't know. That's best way I can leave this. Fantastic. Great way to leave it. Great episode. So we already told them chrisnoggle.com. Are there other places that they can go to get more and the, and the YouTube channel? Are there other mm -hmm. places they can go to get more of you and more of this stuff? I mean, I'm on every social channel, yeah. so you can go to TikTok, you get some good laughs on there, but okay. I've got hundreds of you know, thousands of followers there, lots of haters there. So if you want to dig into the TikTok, hate, there I feel you go. like it's a big hater platform. Dude, People I made love a to shirt hate on that says, TikTok. I made a shirt that says haters need hugs too, solely for TikTok, because <laughs> that statement that I just gave you with Will Rogers yeah. rings so true on TikTok, but Instagram, I'm, I'm post every day, uh, Facebook, eh. You know, I still post on there, but uh, you can find me on any channel. I still answer all my own DMs. So if you want to get to know me, like DM me, go on Instagram and DM me. Guess who's going to answer? This guy. TikTok, you can post negative things. You can post anything you want. I'm pretty much done answering people. I might beat <laughs> you up and start. A, I might start a fight with you, you know, because yeah. it's fun, man. Tick, right. That helps my algorithm. So if you want to <laughs> pick a fight, go to TikTok and we'll, we'll, we'll put the gloves on and go yeah. back and forth. I love it. I love it. All right. So I'll make sure that I put all that, including the TikTok, so people can go argue with Chris um, in the show notes. Uh, I will also put the morningspotlight.com, the morningspotlight at gmail.com, the website and email address of the show, just in case for some reason you want to go through me to get to Chris. I would happy to be, be happy to make that introduction. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for coming on with us today. This was epic. This was a fantastic was, episode. I had a ton of fun, Mike. And I think, yes, we could definitely be friends, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's it awesome. definitely, definitely <laughs> could, could go round two and yeah. three. It's super, super awesome. So awesome. thank you. I love it. I love it. Thank you. And the spotlighters, thank you for listening. And we will catch you next time.